This is Idea Nosh, a podcast where we explore ideas that shape our world. I'm Summer Rain Oaks, and I am thrilled to bring on one of my good friends and comrade in arms to the show. Photographer Joseph Anthony Lawrence, or Joey L, as he is often referred to, is joining me today. As many of you know, Joey was on my last podcast, which is actually how I met him. So it's so awesome to bring him on for a second round after getting to know him after the last couple years. Now, I normally open the show up for questions in advance, but we're going to be talking about his recent independent trip to Iraq and Syria to photograph the Kurdish guerrilla fighters. And at the time of this recording, the series wasn't even released yet. But let me tell you, Since its release, it has created quite a flurry of excitement and outpouring of support. It has not only been featured on the front cover of the independent magazine in the UK, but also in the pages of Vanity Fair Italia and his behind-the-scenes video that he shot while on the front line and resistance lines of the war has already garnered over tens of thousands of views. And actually, I'm I'm guessing it's probably closer to 100,000 views now since it is a Vimeo staff pick. But the result is that people are learning about the human side of the conflict over in Iraq and Syria in a whole new way. And that's what we're going to discuss today. So, Joey, I know um, you've been listening to Idea Nosh, so you know a little bit of the routine. But as always, we start with a quote that inspires some conversation. So the quote that I picked out for you today is by none other than Margaret Thatcher. And she says, look at a day when you are supremely satisfied at the end. It's not a day when you lounge around doing nothing. It's a day you've had everything to do and you've done it. And my question to you is, what was the last day that you were supremely satisfied and what did you do? I can't think of a like a specific day because then there would be a lot of uh, pressure on me to describe the details of that day. But I can say in general, um, I feel the best when I accomplish a task. And it's I think it's a cliche actually for photographer or artist or whatever to say like, oh, like money doesn't satisfy me or like blah, blah, blah doesn't satisfy me. And like only hard work does. Mm-hmm. But it's true. And um, I get giddy and I feel like really good about something when I visualized it before. And then suddenly I found it in front of me. And uh, I guess a sort of like whirlwind has happened. And I don't know how the fuck it got there. (laughs) Do you know what I mean? Yeah, totally. I had an idea. uh, And then I went through maybe hell and back on some trip or project or whatever. And then it's like sitting there on my computer. (laughs) And that's a nice feeling because it was born um, out of uh, blood, sweat and tears. So uh, I don't know what the word is to describe this kind of person, but maybe I'm the kind of person who gets satisfaction from hard work. Yeah. I mean, I think that there is something to be said about having a tangible product at the end of the day and like you know you're a portrait photographer so you have that portrait kind of staring back at you Mm. as a constant reminder that yeah this is something that you did and even though it's a stationary you know photo I'm sure every time you look at it there's a wealth of experience and perhaps funny stories or memorable stories that that come off of that particular photo that you've you've taken Yeah, that's the nice thing about photography is because um, there are other projects I've done where you work on a huge crew and it's amazing time for teamwork and collaboration, like say on a video project where everybody brings like a unique skill to the table. But actually photography is quite selfish and a lot of it is just what you made with the subject and uh, obviously you have help, but it's something different where the minute you create it, you do have a physical thing right? Like you have a physical um, thing on paper and that's when it's completed. Mm. Um, And it's a weird feeling. It's like uh, maybe like giving birth. (laughs) You know what I mean? Yeah, for sure. And I think that one thing that, um, and uh, and of course, like giving birth is is not just 
it's a it's a whole process, and mm-hmm. um, and I think that's one thing that maybe perhaps Miss Thatcher's quote doesn't reflect on on your part, and is a sense that yeah, you have this photo, but there's so much that went into the making of that photo and post afterwards. You know, it's not just like you you took a photo and you have it. Um, you're there sitting with it sometimes for, you know, in, in a series of photos that you're sitting there for, for days and trying to find like the right one that best captured that moment or best captured that person's um, feeling or sentiment that you were feeling at that time because you are really deeply connected to the subjects and to the, the matters that you're, you're photographing. So, you know, it's hard to say. I could see how it could be a challenging to say, you know, what was my, my last satisfying day because some of this is like a build up over time for sure. Yeah. Also, I'm just like a uh, nihilistic artist, like <laughs> no day is good. <laughs> so maybe that's that's why I hesitate on that yeah, question. Yeah, no, too. for sure. I mean, it's not it's it's I think it's one thing being it, it's funny because like you you want to be grateful for the things that you've been given and you want to stop and pause. And that's something that I've had to, to learn. Mm. Um, I wouldn't say that I'm nihilistic in any kind of capacity. I'm much more optimistic and, um, and really, I, I didn't know that, <laughs> <laughs> but, um, you know, I think that there is this aspect of, yeah, I, I could be satisfied with that day, but I'm not satiated, which means, you know, I, I don't feel even full. know what that word means. Well, it just means like you feel full. It's like you could feel grateful for a day, but you're you're not like you're not feeling so full that you can't eat a little bit more or that you want you want to satiated. do more. Satiated. That's satiated. a nice word. Yeah. That's so you could be nice satisfied word. and grateful without being satiated. Nice. And, and I think that's a that's I learned a, something today. <laughs> well, hopefully it's something that you could adopt, because I think that you know, and looking at your, your body of work and kind of, um, knowing you for the the years that I've known you and seeing you grow is, is quite impressive. And I think that there is much to be, to be grateful for, and also much to look forward to, which I guess brings me to the next question, because, um, you know, by the time this podcast comes out, you'll, you'll have a, a body of work out from your recent trip to Kurdistan. And for those who follow your work, they will have known that you've uh, you have gone to to I, uh, Iraq and Syria and the the Kurdistan region, and I think, you know, because this is a relatively new subject for for folks, um, it, it's more of a, a newer subject for for you at least to display. It's not something new that you haven't not been not been thinking about or working on. But um, I kind of want to give a sense of not just why you were there, but maybe kind of the the Cliff's Notes version or Kurdistan for Dummies version of what it is and what's happening there. And maybe even prior to saying that, I want to push it out to the, the listeners that we're probably going to be saying a lot of acronyms <laughs> over the next like hour or so. And I think what I'll end up doing is doing like a Cliff's Notes version of, of acronyms in case somebody gets lost because we're not all... Um, experts in this area. And I think that we're going to be introducing a lot of new topics. But if you can, just explain a little bit about the Kurdistan region, where you flew into, who are the the parties that we should know so that when we start talking about your time there, people aren't totally lost. Okay, so I'll give you the Cliff Notes version of what I know. And if you like, we could have a podcast for, you know, 10 hours about uh, Kurdistan, but I'll try to make it short and snappy for people to understand. Yeah. So bullet points, Kurds, bullet points. Kurds, Kurds describe themselves as the largest um, ethnic group without a country. And um, after World War I, when the British and the French divided the Middle East, as they called it, or West oh. Asia, in the more correct term, um, they divided it into the countries we know today through an agreement called Sykes-Picot. And um, that's how actually all the royal families or dictators that we know today came into power Countries like Iraq, Syria, Iran, t- Turkey, all those things were carved out of the Ottoman Empire. The people who are missed, there are a lot of distinct ethnic groups that really uh, got shortchanged <laughs> on that agreement. But probably one of, the, one of the biggest ones was land of the Kurds or Kurdistan. So let's jump forward now. A whole bunch of things and <laughs> historical things happen right. that I won't say on this podcast because right. it would be hours long. But basically today, 
because of the instability in the region, because of jihadist groups like Jabhat al-Nusra and Islamic State and the Syrian dictator losing control of his country, Kurds have begun to reclaim what they consider Kurdistan in both uh, Iraq, which was um, autonomous before the war, but mostly in Syrian Kurdistan called Rojava. So they've taken this w uh, very rare window in history uh, to claim back, claim back land that they say is theirs that is uh, predominantly ethnically Kurdish because they have no other uh, force to actually defend them militarily because the Syrian regime, as guilty of atrocities as they are, they can't even protect the um, ethnic group that they um, don't really care about, let's say. <laughs> so they've, they've withdrawn from that region and the Kurds have taken up arms themselves. Most notably in uh, Iraqi Kurdistan, you have the Peshmerga, who is the official uh, fighting force of the Kurdistan regional government who get a lot of attention in the mainstream press, of course, rightfully so. But there's also these uh, guerrilla fighting groups that um, are who I photographed, let's say the less official fighting groups of Kurdistan. And um, they get a lot of shit done. Let's put it that way. <laughs> They're amazing fighters, uh, volunteer fighters called uh, PKK and YPG. Now the PKK, um, I should note right now, Kurdistan Workers Party is listed as a terrorist organization. They were around way before the outbreak of, the, of this specific war because they had uh, fights with uh, Turkey and they claimed that they were fighting for uh, Kurdish freedom and try to fight away from oppression of Turkey. But rather than get into a whole other wormhole here, let's say that this group has found a new fight today uh, in fighting the Islamic State. And because of that fight, they've gained a lot of attention and credibility. This terrorist moniker or label that they have on them really is in a way like a legacy label because they've maybe turned over a new leaf, so to speak, to fight a greater issue. And that's what, protecting the rights of Kurds or fighting for a country? What is it in particular that's driving them? It is, a, um, the, I mean, the PKK's ideology is really interesting because some people might describe it as flip-flopping. They would describe it as evolving. So in the 80s, when they were fighting against the Turks, it was a huge military operation and um, still guerrilla fighting. But you can't say that the specific individuals fighting ISIS now are the same people. A lot of the commanders are the same. But yes, they have a legacy issue, of course, um, as being described as, uh, as terrorists. But if you h held some of the other uh, groups in this conflict to the same standards, they would be called terrorists too. So it's, it is a weird label, and I don't think that... Um, the American press or whoever should gloss over it because it is important to note and it is important to see more so how these groups emerge uh, in these times of strife and actually to know who you're dealing with because there's a lot of groups who the Americans uh, call moderate rebels and arm and we find out that um, it was a bad decision and they partner with other unsavory groups who aren't American allies. So. I think it should be investigated, actually, this label of terrorism and how it came to be. But I also, speaking of like what you call a legacy issue, um, I also think that we should hold them to the standards of what they're doing today. So back to their ideology, it's evolving and it's changing. And the most simplistic way, I think, to describe it is uh, it's evolved into more internal struggle, and that might manifest into militant action through clashes against the Islamic State, this ideology of democracy and freedom for Kurdish people. But the fact is, is it's, it's an ideolo ideology first and a military movement second. And how does the YPG and the YPJ, which is more of like the women's group of the YPG, right? Um, or so you're talking about Syria now? Yes. Because PKK is in Iraq? That's right. Yeah. So and how, do, how do they differ or similar? Do they work together? Are they separate? Uh, men and women fighters? Mm -hmm. uh, so in, uh, in, in Syria, 
you have another group of guerrilla fighters called YPG and YPJ, um, People's Protections Units, Women's Protection Unit. Whom you also shot. Yeah, who, who mm-hmm. I also photographed, who, who are very similar to PKK, but they don't like being described as the same organization. People say that when they like, there's a lot of connections, but I can understand why they'd want to somehow distance themselves from PKK. But they have the same ideological leader. A lot of PKK commanders came into Rojava uh, at the very starting to sort of like get things sailing. And now other YPG have taken the roles of commanders that were formerly belonged to PKK. But anyway, um, so it, it is a separate organization. But um, I think one of the things that's... Uh, enamoring about them to us is they have equal men and women and uh the goals of their revolution of equality are displayed in their soldiers and um in ypg you can find men and women almost 50 50 but ypj is a women's issues uh specifically um for women but because the islamic state is uh considered guilty of atrocities against women so that could be like enslavement uh, of Izidi Kurds, uh, it could be rape. Um, these are women's issues. So YPJ and YPG, you can find them together on front lines mm-hmm. fighting against ISIS. Mm-hmm. They might have a different label on their out, uh, military uniform, but their ranks are uh, mixed in this specific uh, war. And I think what's really interesting about you know some of these Kurdish fi- fighters, regardless of what um, faction they're fighting under, is that, and, and this is you know not to be understated, that there is tolerance among them you know, to even have any kind of military, whether it's official or unofficial, uh, have both men and women. I mean, even, even the U.S. military, it's, it's mainly men. Um, you would never find that, obviously, in, in anything with ISIS because they have, um, you know, their, their, we all know what their views are about women there. And, and I think that's, you know, Quite, quite appealing, and, and rightfully so. Um, but there's also religious tolerance, and you just mentioned the Yazidi, which is a is, which is a new kind of word for probably a lot of people hearing. And um, I know that you went to a refugee camp of um, Yazidi uh, re- refugees, and how they're Kurdish people, but they have a different kind of religion, and yet they are tolerated um, within not only tolerated but but really accepted within the Kurdish community. And talk maybe a little bit about that before we go into more of your work. Well, most people, I would say the most people say that Izidi um, are Kurdish ethnically and practice a uh, different religion, minority religion. But some Izidis actually aren't comfortable with that. They say like, no, we're Izidi first and maybe not Kurdish. Or some Izidis... uh, feel tricked by the Kurdish government and the relationship sometimes is not so good. For example, a lot of Izidi feel that the Kurdistan regional government uh, retreated uh, and allowed ISIS into their lands. So Meaning the Peshmerga. The Peshmerga, Mm -hmm. right. And um, so some Izidis (laughs) in 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 certain times might say we're Izidis first and maybe Arab second, depending who the ruler is. This is in all minority groups because they have to do this thing for survival. I think ethnically they are Kurdish, but I mean, the region is mixed of all kind of, it's a crossroads of all kind of people. So let's just, it's a nice thing to say Izidi Kurd instead of Izidi people for Izidis who live in Kurdistan. So that's why I use that specific term in my writing, but I'm sure some of the elders who feel like uh, sold out would be like, no, we're not Kurdish. (laughs) Right. So it's, it's a thing, but actually, so sorry to answer your question. Um, In the refugee camps, most of them in the Syrian side, at least are um, guerrilla protected. So these are um, the guerrillas are credited with uh, creating a corridor after the Sinjar massacre. That's when ISIS attacked the main Izidi area Guerrillas have uh, been credited to create a huge corridor for thousands of people to escape and settle in uh, safety zones uh, in uh, northeast Syria. And uh, in those camps, you can find that they're protected by guerrillas, by uh, YPG. Um, 
so they have a really good relationship with these with these gorilla fighters, but not so much with uh, the Peshmerga. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Depends who you ask. Um, there's some very elaborate conspiracy theories, um, and there's some facts too. So it just depends. Everyone loves a good conspiracy theory, and I think that they start to feel more real when you're out there in the the heat of war. I would imagine, and yeah. also it's convoluted nature because it well, gets really complex. The fact is, is when when ISIS and like this is ad- admitted, and uh, even the Peshmerga. Um, said that they would um, investigate the commanders who retreated, although I'm not sure if it was ever done. When the Islamic State approached the Sinjar region from Mosul and Tel Afar, um, they were able to drive right into Sinjar without any fights through checkpoints, and the Peshmerga did withdraw. Now, whether that's a tactical withdrawal is a different story because... A fighting force like Islamic State has a shitload of American weapons and they have this uh, air about them through their propaganda that's very fearful. So I can see how someone would feel sold out because there was no fighting. And to me, the biggest problem is there was no warning. Right. If, if you want to do a tactical retreat, you should at least tell the people that you're retreating from and help them flee. Yeah. And that's my biggest criticism, actually, yeah. is I don't expect anyone militarily to fight a convoy that, they, that they're not prepared for. But you, you have to tell the people who you know are from a, a um, religious sect that the Islamic State is going to slaughter. They're not going to enslave or uh, like occupy like Mosul. They'll take the modest slaves or massacre the men. So if you know that, as they've done many times before in that region with Shia or other religious minorities, you have to help them retreat. And yeah, it's it's a it's an awful story uh, what happened to the Yazidis. Yeah, I mean that's not something to be overlooked, and I think that knowing you getting back, just making statements of how many checkpoints that you had to go through to feel that you know this main road all the way from Mosul to to Sinjar region, you know, just doesn't didn't have any checkpoints um, or ones that were visible to people, or you know that that to me seems reasonable to think that there was some kind of like conspiracy to it. yeah totally you know, it's, not... it's it's the best grounds for conspiracy yeah. theory also what about this why do airstrikes now when isis is embedded in, in your city with mm-hmm. cover mm-hmm. with buildings what what when the convoy was driving in an open desert road wouldn't that be a good time for airstrikes instead of this disaster after yeah and the same could civilians. be said for Tikrit or ramadi like it's just, I think it's a lack of intelligence. Well, I, I mean, I think that this, this whole war that's happening, you know, obviously far away from our views is so yet so close to home in a sense, because even though that we don't have like a, a huge you know, population of, of Kurdish people here, um, and Europe probably is taking on um, more of the, if you want to say the burden of, of refugees going into and across their borders, It does really affect us and whether we choose to kind of read it in the headlines or not. I mean, just recently, as we were um, discussing earlier, is that, you know, Congress, um, the House has just uh, passed a law for 2016 or a vote for 2016 to actually arm some of the Peshmerga. Directly. Directly. Instead of through Baghdad. Yes, instead of through Baghdad. So, you know, before it was like illegal to arm anybody outside of going through the the Iraqi, the main Iraqi government, which is in the capital of Baghdad. And as, as you, you know, some of this gets into the Iraqi police and and then ISIS kills them and then ISIS gets the American made weapons. But, um, you know, we don't we have less and less troops on the ground. So, you know, is the best option for fighting ISIS if that's what we're going to do. And I think that we're so far in that it's something that we kind of in a way have we're, we're in too deep. So now the vote that has been passed is that we would be doing 25% of the money that it typically is going to Baghdad would be for arming the Peshmerga, which again is a huge, um, a huge issue and has effects on all American citizens. And I know the Iraqi government has really come back and said, no, you know, we, we, we are totally against that. 
and um, and rightfully so because they're you know they might look at the Peshmerga as not their army, um, and that's a threat to them. They're we're taking twenty five percent of their money away, and um, and also it's just been opened up um, days ago that uh, you know about a dozen Democrats are saying, hey, we need to take more Syrian refugees. I mean, I think that U.S. has maybe taken in 2,000, and now there's a proposition on the table to take in tens of thousands. And this, of course, has effects on on, on the U.S. because there is, it would be wrong to deny the, the fact, this is perception, but perception is reality for some, that there is this anti- Muslim kind of um, or growing concern because of things that we don't understand. And um, and so it is affecting us directly and indirectly. And I think what's really beautiful about um, some of the stuff that you um, are trying to convey is like, again, through your portraits, bringing this closer to home and getting us to understand it more and um, and helping us ask kind of like, difficult questions that we might have not been faced to ask before. Yeah, I mean, you, you said a lot of things there. Um, I, I, and certain things came to my mind as you were saying them. I think, uh, interestingly enough, um, the Americans had to go through Baghdad to arm the Peshmerga, the uh, Kurdish forces, but now they're seeing what good fighters they are and actually what good allies they are and actually like ignore their retreat from Sinjar, they're actually a very good fighting force. Like they're surrounding Mosul right now. I don't think that the, I think the Americans know that they can't depend on Kurds to fight in non-Kurdish areas because it adds to um, sectarian tensions. Like if they were to go to the, you could never say the Kurds will go liberate Anbar province. <laughs> <laughs> it, would, it would probably be a disaster. Um, but they will protect Kurdish areas. And if you, have ISIS dwelling next door, yeah, you're going to need a little bit of support for however long that might be. So the guerrilla groups that I photographed, a lot of them fight alongside Peshmerga. So in my opinion, arming the Peshmerga directly is a good thing because they've proven themselves to be an ally. And uh, to be honest, you're running out of allies in that region. <laughs> so Yeah, well, I also think from... E e even if you don't like Kurds and you don't sympathize with their costs, I'm afraid your options are very, very slim. Yeah. And I also think from the Iraqi side, I mean, if I, if I had to like look at it from their perspective, I mean, they're probably in a way um, shaking in their shoes that, you know, of, and this you implied this, that the Kurds aren't, aren't going to be fighting outside of their region, largely because perhaps they are in this for a long-term goal, which is to have their own independence or have their own country. And maybe what Iraq is looking at it as is like, hey, we've given some of them their autonomy in northern Iraq, but you know, there could be this potential for the Kurds to unite across you know, Tur Turkey, mm -hmm. Iraq, Syria, maybe even Iran, and, and form this new country maybe it's Rojava, maybe it's the start of Rojava, maybe it's something else different, I don't know. But if you look at it from a long-term perspective, that that could very well happen. You know, maybe five, ten years from now, um, we're not going to be talking about countries like Iraq and Syria and Iran any longer. Well, I think if, if Kurdistan had its own uh, country, you would also see other splintering of those countries as well along other sectarian lines, for example, Sunni and Shia. That's that's oversimplifying it. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, you can kind of see how the map looks right now. You have a sect of Shia called uh, Alawite, which is uh, Assad, the dictator of Syria's uh, religious group. And actually, the areas that he's most interesting the areas he's most interested in defending are along the coast. Um, and they're all Alawite areas. Mm -hmm. So I criticize Assad. I think he's probably worse than ISIS. Um, but you also have to ask yourself if you were to overthrow that regime, what happens to all those millions of uh, Alawite, right? So it's a very uh, tricky circumstance. And I would, I would imagine that Syrians who are pro-Assad in support of the dictator, like you could say an Assad loyalist, they might not be 
just a loyalist to Assad, that specific person, but they are a loyalist to the idea of having a country called Syria. So I think we make the mistake of saying like, how could these people be loyal to such a vile animal, right? Who like is guilty of uh, chemical attacks or barrel bombs. But I think Syrians in support of Assad are more in support of the country that once was, or at least defending um, Alawite sects away from a lot of these jihadist groups that declare them as infidels that'll slaughter them the first chance they get. And that's just not ISIS. That's a pretty much all the jihadist groups who claim to have a Salafi uh, ideology. So it's a huge mess and it's not like there's, uh, it's very hard to establish a simple good versus evil narrative in the region like you could put in hindsight on some other wars. Um, it's just a giant mess, basically. Well, I, I know um, you've gained a lot of knowledge from your trip back from Iraq and Syria, and, and you knew a lot going in. But what was it, what was initially that, that drew you there in the first place? A lot of things. I think that, um, I mean, speaking not about the issues, about me, myself, I've always been interested in the area. And of course, like guerrilla fighters are, are extremely interesting by nature in, in every country, whether they're FARC guerrilla <laughs> fighters or like Maoist rebels in Nepal. They have interesting uh, spin on things because they're like these like ragtag controversial figures in any country, but especially in this movement, it's, it's very interesting. So what drew me there, um, actually on that trip, I guess was, uh, if you want to call it living history, I followed that conflict so closely on Twitter. Like I followed, um, YPG's English speaking Twitter account, mainstream news. I followed jihadist fighters on Twitter to like, see their perspective and just combined it all. And um, honestly, I was just more like a like a hobbyist, if you want to give that term to like looking at war with hobby is kind of weird. But I was just following the conflict out of interest because it's like living history. And these borders are being redrawn and reshaped. And like you say, in 10 years down the road, we look and those countries are changed and are not there anymore. But then all of a sudden, uh, I had a very rare opportunity to actually go photograph them. And it was a self-funded independent trip. But I guess um, quite auspiciously, I came across a really good contact and good fixer uh, in Iraqi Kurdistan. And it's something that I didn't know how it was possible. How could I go there and like be safe and do this photography project? And then all of a sudden uh, I was aligned with my fixer and then no more than a month later I found myself on a plane going there. So I was really well read on the subject and knew about it. But in terms of like actually me thinking that I could go and be safe and operate in that region to going was very short, if that makes sense. Yeah, it really does. And, it, and it's almost like one of those shocking moments where you're just like, Oh shit! Oh shit! Oh shit! I'm here, and and it's a in like I said, it's like a different kind of um, project for you because this is one of the first times that you're like in a in a real you know real bona fide like war zone, and I'd imagine that packing your gear maybe wasn't so hard, but taking some necessary precautions for safety might have been a little bit of a a curve in the road for you. Yeah, I've never seen the war like that in my entire life. Um, I, I've been in some like very small clashes uh, between a tribe called Bodhi and uh, the Ethiopian uh, police. Um, and that was terrifying. Um, but even again, if you were to like wave a white flag, like I was, I was uh, hiding inside of a uh, trucker's lodge <laughs> but if i were to wave a white flag there it'd be no problem like the police don't want to kill me in the bodhi tribe especially don't want to kill me their interest is fighting one another so although in that specific occurrence you know maybe a stray bullet or something could have happened likely not <laughs> in, in iraq and syria uh the opposition if I waved the white flag, it would be very bad news for me. <laughs> so it was a different uh, circumstance. And of course, the weaponry is way different and just way more dangerous. So 
anyway, when I went there, I, I actually, I acknowledge that. Like, I don't think I'm bulletproof. Um, a lot of my friends, like you warned me against it. Like, Joey, be careful. Like, I know like you, you're an egomaniac. So like, be careful. Uh, don't let like your ego get in the way of like s smart decisions. And like, I know that, but I was glad I was warned by my friends before I went. But honestly, I never really, I never really, um, put myself in, in too much danger. Um, because the style of my photography with portrait photography, there's not much interest in front lines anyway. So I, I mean, I was on some front lines, <laughs> but the majority of time was spent uh, on what is called a resistance line, which is five lines back from the front line. So you can observe the battle, you can see some things, but you're in relative safety except for mortars and shit like that. Um, but anyway, I knew my limits as a photographer and I made a lot of decisions sometimes to leave places that got too dangerous because of my inexperience. And the last thing I actually want to be is a, like a war tourist or something like that, where it's like uh, <laughs> Vice News, like, oh, guys, look at this. Quick, look at my haircut. We're like here in Syria. We're getting bombed. This is cool selfie time. Like, I wanted to be really careful from that sort of vibe because simply because I haven't done anything like that before. And I'm someone with no experience. So mm -hmm. I operated really slowly and uh, really carefully. And um, I'm back. So. I proved my point. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm sure you'll go again. So I think that the, the familiarity of going there will be a little less stressful because I know even when I go into an area that isn't in war and then I a approach a new airport with people who probably don't speak the English language, there is an element where you feel like your senses are all on display and you immediately feel like you're out of place. So I'd imagine that you traveling there, just getting a sense of the geography and how the airport is structured, checkpoints, people questioning, you're putting a hell of a lot of trust in your fixers who I know met you at the airport. What I'm maybe getting at is like for those who are interested in going into different countries and maybe particularly into war zones, what is the type of research that you, you had to do and to put yourself in to, to find the right fixers? Because I think the, the people that you had worked with from speaking with you were, were really good and excellent at their job. Well, I was, to back up a bit, I was actually instructed uh, <laughs> by some by some journalists who are a lot more credible uh, than some small photography project like what I did. They told me that when people ask you about, like you're gonna get a lot of people asking you about your, your trip and is it safe and what should I do, blah, blah, blah. And they said, don't write those people back <laughs> because you're gonna be held accountable when they get captured. They're gonna look to your email that you said it was fine. So uh, there's actually a guy, um, I won't say his name, but he, he was suggesting that he was saying when people go, don't help them. And I, I can't really see myself not helping people, but I would warn against it because there is a lot of research and, um, uh, legwork involved before. So my stance would be, if you're going to do that for a year, then you'll probably be all right. <laughs> and if you're not, it's you're, you are taking a risk and, you know, it is upon yourself, not on my email saying it was OK. But anyway, um, what can people do if they want to uh, go anywhere? It doesn't matter if it's a war zone or not, because there's some uh, cultural sensitivity, some places, too, outside of war zones that need to be researched. So I would say it all starts first with just having an understanding of where you're going and the history and um Honestly, when you go to a place and you know historical facts about people, they get really excited that like that immediately separates you from the average visitor. Um, you have to work slow. You have to be incredibly patient. Um, a lot of countries don't operate like New York City, like go, 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 go. And it's hard to um, withdraw yourself from uh, New York City lifestyle, fast paced and go to some of these places because it's like rubber time. So you have to be incredibly patient. And I think that's probably my, my, my biggest suggestion. Uh, the other thing is, um, I think the best photographers or researchers or writers or anthropologists or whoever also 
are uh, good at, what is the word I'm looking for? Uh, they're very good at uh, molding to a situation. So let's put it this way. If I wanted to recap the events of last night, I would tell you a story, right? But to my grandmother, I would tell the same story, but differently. You understand? So uh, it's the same story. It's not lying, but you're, sh you're, you're shaping to the person that you're talking to, right? So being constantly ready and like on your feet and being able to shift with the times and having a plan, but that could all change, right? So there's all these uh, contradictory things I'm saying, and it's just more like be a human being, right? And see the conflict or the area or whoever, not through your mold as a North American, but as a humble visitor, patient visitor. That's what I think needs to be done. I mean, I appreciate that approach that you have and it's important not to kind of like put our own assumptions or insinuations like on a, a person or a group of people and let it all play out maybe switching gears a little bit I I wonder I mean I know that you said you took a lot of those necessary precautions there but there had to be moments that you were a little bit scared and yeah of course what were some of those moments well, I'm not uh, someone who comes back from a trip like that and says, like, no, I wasn't scared the whole time. Like, I was, there was definitely scary parts of the trip um, that maybe uh, <laughs> I said to Jan, like my fixer, maybe let's have a quick safety meeting. <laughs> like, totally, like, Hollywood style. <laughs> like, on set in a big production, you always have a safety meeting first just for... Uh, insurance purposes <laughs> and I found myself to Jan saying like ah let's have a safety meeting when we're being mortared or there's a suicide bomber a yeah I was gonna say before or after the mortar strike <laughs> no when when we went into so for so for example there there are two areas where I felt more danger um and again all this goes with saying that I had incredible protection uh being with the guerrilla fighters and Honestly, they would never really allow me to get in harm's way. They would probably get me out of there first before themselves. That's just the nature of how they act, um, which is good for me, of course. But there are, there are two regions where I felt danger. One was in a place called Tel Timur. And if you put that into Google or Twitter, you'll see a variety of clashes that are still ongoing now between Islamic State and uh, YPG, YPJ. And uh, in that place, um, there were clashes all night long and they like killed uh, 15 Islamic State militants while I was there and in the city of Tel Timur there was um, mortars getting closer and closer and Islamic State advancing and it was the first time I'd seen anything like that and uh, I just wanted to get the fuck out of there <laughs> <laughs> but also like photographically speaking all of the commanders were extremely busy you can't just roll up on these places without knowing mm -hmm. people and even be allowed to film or to photograph like you always have to ask the commander and get permission first and state your intentions and at that place everyone was running around um uh fighting that photographically it wasn't happening for me but also just in terms of fear um this fucking building's exploding not too far away so i thought about what i told my friends and me and jan decided that once things settled down and the road became okay to drive on then we left and we went to a different place which was uh nearby but mm, liberated from isis 10 days before called tal hamis and that place was was fine the other uh danger that i felt was in sinjar which we were in the city that was uh 70 percent uh, islamic state held and 30 percent uh, kurdish forces peshmerga and guerrilla groups like pkk and ypg and at that time i was a little bit more used to the trip was a little more trusting um, of Jan and the Grellas. And uh, because of that, I just slept in a building not so far from ISIS, <laughs> maybe 20 to 30 meters away from ISIS position. But um, that place we saw a uh, suicide bombing. Uh, actually, Jan caught it on camera when he was filming me. And um, I guess the the scary, unpredictable thing about the blast was I was nowhere near it to like physically, like it, you can see in the video, it's quite far away. But the Islamic States uh, has 
incredible tactics that to us seem quite bizarre, but militarily they're very interesting because they involve suicide bombers. So when you see a suicide bombing, it could mean two basic things. It could mean that they've dealt a devastating blow to the guerrilla's front lines and they're using foot soldiers to advance. Or it could be just a distraction and they use that suicide bomber's life to create a sort of a smoke screen or distraction to think that there's going to be one of those advances. And then they flank from another totally anticipated side. So when you see that, yes, the blast is scary, but it's more so what, what happens afterward because they're not going to launch a suicide attack unless it's uh, attempting to take a position. So when that happened, I knew enough at that point to just sit back, observe the, th the battle unfold, get a sense of it. With the commander, they monitor the ISIS radio channel to try to put it together. And then if you want to, you can leave after observing that. So I think those were the two specific times that I felt danger. Um, but you have to understand my scale of danger is different from a guerrilla fighter that sees that every single day. And even different from a journalist who've been to war zones, I'm sure that there's a lot that would see that as no big deal. But yeah. to someone like me, it's a terrifying thing, mm -hmm. and I'm not afraid uh, to admit that. And next time I go back, I'll be a little bit uh, more brave, but that's just the truth of how it was. Well, I think, um, again, this goes back to perception is reality, and there's no doubt that there are some intense moments for you. And I wonder, just now that you're back, have you had enough time to retrospectively think about how this has changed you or maybe changed your approach to your own photography? Yes, I think it's um, my personal projects have always with each new one I do get more and more in depth and more, let's say, I don't want to say important because I've always photographed important subject matter. But I think that they have more meaning in the sense of um, history. And I really want to make historical photographs of uh, things changing with time. A lot of the places that I were, a lot of the places that I was photographing have already changed. And some of them are retaken back by ISIS. Most of them, uh, the Kurdish forces have advanced even further. So think about that. Like that's something you'll never see again. The portrait of uh, the woman Sorwin by the exploded car in Talhamis. Like that was some guy's car in some guy's house. And, you know, hopefully one day it'll be rebuilt and it'll be a neighborhood and I can visit as a tourist. But that photograph is living proof of the war. Uh, and it's a portrait of a human that, you know, maybe in the future it'll be um, different. So back to your question of personal projects. I've always gravitated towards subjects like that, but I think as I've matured and as I've grown with things, projects like this Guerrilla Fighters of Kurdistan is more along the lines of what I want to do, which is more embedded in historical significance. And so what do you hope for people to take away from this series? I think the, the, the most interesting thing that I can add to the table would be to humanize the conflict. So I've seen so much great uh, photojournalism from the war of amazing action shots and people being mortared and stuff that's newsworthy that help us understand how the conflict moves and how the conflict's changing. But I have not really seen many like humanizing portraits and that can change someone's perspective. So I did it for the Kurdish side. Obviously they're American allies. I'd love to do it for some of the other groups, but I'd, <laughs> to be honest, I don't think they'd have me. I think they'd cut my fucking head off. So it's not going to happen for them. But, I think you're right. <laughs> but to be fair, I would imagine you could probably find some, some human stories in jihadist groups of young men who actually went to overthrow Assad and found themselves fighting Kurds. And over time, maybe they became more radicalized. Like, I honestly think you could find human stories on any side. And that's what I'm trying to say with this, uh, with this series too. Um, so when you look at something like a, like, like a portrait, it's an image frozen in time. Yes. But it's like one of those few things that you can have eye contact with and stare at and the person doesn't look away. And there's something that happens, uh, inside of a human when they see that, that they connect to. 
even the most cold, bitter person has a connection with photography. So my goal was to set off and humanize a side of the conflict, which is mostly only seen in the realm of photojournalism, people without names, uh, people without stories, uh, that, that sort of thing. That was my goal. And you've said to me at one point that, you know, you're, you're not approaching this from a photojournalist or as a photojournalist or as a, as a journalist. And therefore, you know, you don't have to have this kind of unbiased opinion on the matter. What do you mean by that? And how does that manifest in your photography in a way? Well, let me start off by saying that I'm incredibly inspired by journalists and photojournalism, especially the integrity that's involved with that line of work. Because, for example, like there's a lot of photographers that gloss over things and they're maybe artsy fartsy about something. Say, like, well, I didn't need to do that because like you're not seeing the meaning. So like I think my work is probably more photojournalistic than it is fine art. But the way I describe it is just like portraits. Right. So I take a lot of inspiration from that realm, but and it's important <laughs> for our news not to be biased and not to be infiltrated by evil lizard kings. <laughs> uh, but for, for me personally, I don't have to have that because I'm a photographer. So I can have strong opinions about things and I can make a body of work that says something. So what the Grail Fighters of Kurdistan project is about is yes, there's a war with exploded cars and like borders that change, but there's also an ideological war inside. So the goal of a photographer is very hard in this regard because you have a very external medium like photography trying to show a very internal thing like an ideology. So how do you do that? Well, you can do that with a human portrait, right? So that's what I set off to, to do. And that's why I can ha I'm allowed to have incredible bias and make a point and make a stance and say this is the, the body of work. Many people know you from your Holy Men series, which is an ongoing series that you've started when you were a teenager. Knowing where you are now in your work and what you've learned along the way and the different kind of skill sets that you've kind of put onto your work from this Kurdistan project and others, how would you now approach a series like Holy Men? Yeah, I mean, subjects like the Omo Valley series and Holy Men are still really important to me. And um, just because they're out of the news doesn't mean they don't have historical significance. But I mean, me as a photographer, stylistically, I would approach it a little bit different. Um, I would incorporate a lot more objects and movement and landscapes as well as like working within the portraits, because sometimes those can be a really telling. Like in Grella Fighters of Kurdistan, I series, there's a picture of a... Um, of a jihadist flag that's on the ground in an abandoned ISIS base that the guerrillas took over. And there was um, military equipment and uh, ammunition scattered around the floor with this flag. And it's a flag of monotheism. And, um, you know, I've seen things like that in holy men territory, but I never photographed it because it wasn't a portrait. So, I think, honestly, if I reapproach those series, I would take a step back and observe this thing uh, with a more critical eye. It's not to say that I'm not happy with the portraits. I think there's a lot of beautiful portraits in those series. I just would have taken a step back and included more things in it that are stylistically cohesive, but like a, a, like a, like a breath <laughs> away from like all of these faces. So the other thing that I'll mention is I think that I just grew up because you have to understand, like I started those series when I was like 16, 17. And the way I see the world now is actually a lot different. And um, I would I would be looking, I might be looking for things, maybe not just to celebrate those people, but also show the other side of things. Because although I love to present people with dignified portraits, let's be honest, a lot of <laughs> holy men are also bigots, <laughs> right? So it'd be interesting uh, to explore the other side of the thing and include that in this series as well. And uh, that's sort of the way that I, that I think now is sort of like bigger picture. And I would be a little bit more investigative, right? And not just observing the things that are presented in front of me. And I think that's what I would change. I think that's what's really <clears throat> wonderful and about how you approach your photography is that it is more of an ongoing series. You are 
vested in these themes, if you will, over a long term. And that's something that's really important to you that I know. It's not like something that you go in and out and, you know, you've shot it, you've, you love them, you leave them and you're gone. You know, this is something that you will return to over and over again. It would be impossible for me to do that with as much depth. Um, I just, I can't imagine if I was given an editorial assignment of something like that's interesting, but I don't really passionately care about, I think it'd be really hard for me to go and perform at a high level when I take on that subject. So luckily the commercial work that I've been taking on recently is stuff that I'm like really passionate about and I think is cool. But honestly, the way that I started photography, taking on a little bit of this and a little bit of that, I honestly don't think I could do it anymore. Mm. Let's like fast forward to the end of this year. What do you hope to... <laughs> That's like the classic summer question. Like, what are your long-term goals? <laughs> well, I think the end of this year is not so long-term. If long-term, I'm thinking like five, ten years, and we mm. all know we don't know the answers to those questions. But, you know, if you know, six months from now, you know, y- you have some of these personal projects that you have on your plate right now that you're in all different aspects of getting out sooner rather than later. And um, yeah, let's fast forward six months. Like, what do you what do you hope to accomplish before the end of the year? Um, I hope to have the the film that uh, we shot in Ethiopia finished, People of the Delta. That's been an ongoing project, just because it's a foreign language film, and there's all these moving parts. And let's be honest, I'm not the best editor in the world of video. I'm incredibly slow, and I need space, and I get frustrated and sidetracked but it's a personal project that doesn't need to be rushed so honestly in six month time it better be out or I'm going to be in a lot of trouble with myself I think we'll see that out there's also a great uh, behind the scenes video shot uh, by our local Ethiopian team that uh, uh, my uh, assistant slash friend Caleb is editing right now and I think that look at the film is actually just as interesting (laughs) as the film itself because uh, the making of that film was quite crazy. Um, Is it going to be a dudes with camera episode? No, no. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, We shot that way before we were doing that, so it could have been, but um, at that time, our our local Ethiopian uh, team shot it in their own way. So uh, I told them to make it from the perspective of how they saw our crew <laughs> and <laughs> they did what they did, well, which is funny. Be interesting. Yeah, 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 which is good. Um, but that, okay. So to back to your question that, that would come out. Um, and as well as, uh, the, uh, Curtis Dan stuff is uh, coming out very soon. I was so lucky last year because I had a lot of commercial projects that I shot and I've been feeling good this year just to get caught up and finish all my uh, personal projects. Um, so maybe I'll take on, you know, more things. I'm shooting a uh, big project, of course, next month that I'm not allowed to say what it is. And I'll be promoting that um, at the end of the year. So um, honestly, my six months plan is quite simply just to finish the shit I started. That would be my six month plan. And then I will be removed from this honor burden. That's a word that I learned from Jared at the last podcast I did, honor burden, because it's an honor to work on these things, but it's also burdensome because you care about them so much. Yeah, for sure. And then I'll probably dedicate more time to um, Kurdistan. I'll go back perhaps, who knows, and uh, add more to the series, maybe see it in the winter time because it'll be different. Maybe things will change. I don't know. But to finish the shit I started, and uh, pledge my honor burden. <laughs> <laughs> well, how are there, is, are, are there going to be ways that you're going to be displaying, you know, this in, in a different way? Are you looking to maybe perhaps show this through gallery settings or books or how, how do you see? Inshallah, that's what I'll say. <laughs> All that stuff, inshallah. <laughs> we'll just leave it at that. But kind of a more philosophical question for you. What do you really want your work to impart on the world and perhaps this is something that is a classic question from summer but and it's a long term as well as a short term thing but um i think that you've been giving that a lot more thought and and what is it that that you want to 
have people take away from your work? I honestly think the best series to mention to answer that question is actually the personal project I did called Halloween in Brooklyn. And the reason why that is, is because the way that I photographed it, they're very contemporary um, pictures in the sense that, you know, they're kids dressed up as Superman and Spider-Man, and it's seemingly modern when you look at those photos. But I do think in 50 years time, when people look back at those photos, uh, they will be engraved in a time and place. So how do people, how do I want people to look at my work? I don't want to use the word legacy because I'll sound like a fucking douchebag, but I would like to have a long-term career and bodies of work that could be looked back at in 50 years as a representative image of a time and place that was, that is no more. And, uh, I think human beings are very romantic about culture. There's a lot of people that fight to uh, defend culture and protect the way that things were and to keep, to keep them the same and to keep an animal in a zoo so it can't evolve into something else and it's stuck as a tiger forever. <laughs> but if you look at the world long term, that's the one thing that, that is true is that things shape shift and they change and they evolve. And culture was never a stagnant thing. Even tribes that are seemingly from thousands of years ago aren't. They're a combination of uh, this group who migrated from there and took on that language and changed into this and that. So our world is constantly spinning and changing, yet photography is the only thing that sort of freezes those moments. So in the future, in a time where things are completely different, there'll be a record to look back on. And that's what I hope to do with the various uh, bodies of work that I create. We're going to move into the last section of this podcast, which is a shorter section. Um, normally, we open it up to questions from the audience, but we didn't really open it up to questions from the audience, um, since this was more about a project that um, it's at, not out yet. At this moment, <laughs> it's, very, it's not very out, hard to get out questions yet. about a project <laughs> that I've been hiding. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, for good intentions, um, but it's it's coming out. And uh, but I did get a chance to ask a question from our mutual friend Paul. His question is, and he stole this from someone, some other, some other podcast, but he, he liked to he liked to reuse it on you. That's okay. If you had a significant chunk of change, what would you do to make the world better? That, of course, assuming that uh, that is what you'd be setting out to do if you had a serious chunk of change. But um, what would you do to make the world a better place? That's a good question, Paul. <laughs> That's a hard question. Because you could give a... The reason why that question is hard is because you could give a very nice poetic answer that doesn't quite answer the question at all. Or you could go like really in depth and say like, well, here's the thing. So <laughs> the big thing is interest, right? So you want to invest in stocks that give interest, that help the community. And then you invest those into refugee camps. Like I could give that kind of answer to help the, the world. But honestly, um, if I had a billion dollars, let's think selfishly, at least for a reason, for a moment, because that's um, the way that I'll answer as a photographer is I would, exp I would expand my own reach and my own uh, team and capabilities of what I could do with the projects, because actually I stand by the fact that I do think they're, they're beneficial to hu humanity. But I would probably actually invest that money in arts projects for others too, other artists that I admire, other filmmakers, other people doing good, and perhaps uh, create a movement of people that do projects that uh, make no money, <laughs> but are very good for humanity. Like a lot of my projects mm -hmm. make no money, but holistically they're good for the world. So. Uh, you know, that's a, that's a troubling question because, um, I'm never going to have a billion dollars. <laughs> so I can only answer it from my very, very small perspective <laughs> of what I, what I've, what I know. <laughs> right. Well, I think that, you know, just hearing you say that though, you know, part of it is that you, as a, as a, maybe a small goal or a, a symptom of what you do, you know, you ho do hope that 
some of the projects that you shoot, including the guerrilla fighters of Kurdistan, others, will eventually become um, maybe reflective of uh, your commercial projects and there'd be this kind of meeting and merging of your personal and commercial projects because in a way you do shoot the portraits very similarly. Well, there is. Mm -hmm. And that's in the last two years um, has been a really nice thing is there is a meeting of those two worlds. And although one is personal and it's self-funded, I would say holistically it helps my career. So these move into a little bit more of um, quick rapid response questions and okay. answers. I, that's usually what I'm better at answering. <laughs> <laughs> you are great. When you are really ripping and tearing behind the lens, what sensation do you feel? Um, like drugs. Euphoria. Yeah. Like, um, you, like it's proven actually that drugs release serotonin in your brain, but so does, um, extreme sports and a roller coaster and getting shit done. So it is like a drug because it is a drug. Mm -hmm. That drug that you take, it, there's not a chemical in it that makes you feel that way. It's a chemical that releases a real thing in your brain that you can do through other things. So I feel like I'm on drugs. <laughs> <laughs> the good kind. The piece of news you wish were more in the press. What I wish was more in the press are actually long form podcast style conversations because there's so many... Uh, politicians and pundits that are so great at debates for three minutes and they get their point in and they tear apart their adversary. But I would imagine that if you were to sit those people down for three hours and talk to them in a podcast, all of a sudden all of their viewpoints and talking points would start to crumble because they might be hollow human beings. <laughs> so in the news and the press, what I'd love to see is something more long form where someone doesn't have time to prepare their talking points and they don't admit that they have all the answers and they those politicians may say you know what i don't have the answer to that question but the foreign policy expert who i'm going to hire does and i would rely on his opinion and i don't think in the news in a news broadcast or a debate any politician would want to say that so more honesty more truth and more long form so we can see who these leaders we entrust actually are. Very good answer. Thank you. If you could photograph three people alive today, who would they be? Ah, that's a good question. Let me think about this for a moment. Like a celebrity person or anybody? Anybody. Alive or dead? Alive. Alive, okay. <laughs> three or one? <laughs> your wish list. Who's your wish list? Who, who would be somebody that you'd get really excited about? Well, I was really excited to photograph the Grub Fighters of Kurdistan. <laughs> so maybe go back and do more portraits there. Maybe um, Abdullah Ocalan? <laughs> would he fall in your top three? Uh, it would be a controversial, uh, controversial portrait, but it would be one of historical significance. I think I'd, I'd really like to photograph um, uh, politicians, presidents, leaders, um, controversial figures like Edward Snowden, um, you know, people who, <laughs> let's say if I posted on my Facebook would be a great debate, <laughs> but a powerful telling portrait where that debate is curved slightly by my portrait. That would be interesting. So yeah, there's some prominent people who are more photogenic than others, but if that if a photogenic face is the only thing that guides your photo, then it's a little bit of a crutch. So let me answer your question by saying um, I'd love to photograph portraits of notable figures. To pick three is very hard. Yeah. And that might be controversial to inspire debate. I said that because you mentioned photographing the leader, ah. the ideological leader of PKK. I think a lot of people from Turkey uh, who follow my Facebook might feel that a little bit unsettling because in Turkey he's viewed as a terrorist leader guilty of um, car bombings, uh, being responsible for the kidnapping of tourists to destabilize the tourism industry in Turkey. Um, but to other people he would be seen as a freedom fighter and as the leader of a revolution against an oppressed uh, ethnic minority. So that would inspire a lot of debate is what I was saying. <laughs> Favorite part of your photographic process is? 
being in the field is really, really different and unique because I talk about this with our friend Sam Spratt a lot, who's the painter and illustrator. SamSpratt.com, everybody. <laughs> um, what's different from what me and Sam do is Sam can create a painting from scratch, right? And he doesn't have to go in the field. He doesn't have to have this famous prominent person give him two minutes and you better not fuck it up. He can spend some time and create a masterful piece of work. Um, and that's something that I really envy, but something that he envies about my workflow is I get to go out and have a human experience and human connection with things away from my computer, at least until the retouching process. So I think the, 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 the best thing about my work is, is those times is going out in the field and, um, interacting maybe being in danger, having that uh, rush, and then also reflecting on that afterwards. Your least favorite part of the photographic process is? The least favorite part of my photographic process is the word minutia or minutiae. I don't know how to say it because I've only <laughs> seen it. <laughs> I've only seen it on a page. Minutia? Minutia. Minutia is the mundane things that bog you down, that take up your time, that are important, to running your business and need to be taken care of, but don't really propel you <laughs> any further and just sort of keep you at the same level. So those could be emails, it could be organizing, it could be backing stuff up, it could be uh, making a pitch for a future job that will be awesome, that will benefit you, that will be an incredible experience and create a credible body of work, but you have to like write the pitch of what you're going to do. Those things, uh, to me, bog me down and they, bo they bog a lot of creative people down. And I think good photographers also run good businesses. So I'm not afraid of those things, but they're definitely the least desirable part about what I do. Creativity is. Mm, uh, creativity maybe is looking at something a different way from somebody else. Your biggest fear is. Same as the last podcast. <laughs> 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 Which, that if I remember being correctly, a phony. Is being phony, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> being not, corny, not being much a has, hack. <laughs> not much has changed. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's a, I think it's a significant fear to have is wanting to do things with credibility and fear being a hack about it. Your biggest challenge is or was? Ever? The Ethiopian film, People of the Delta. It's the hardest thing still I've ever done. What aspect of that was challenging on it's the a, ground? Yeah, it's a foreign language film that um, is hard to explain, not to the people in it, but to the government of Ethiopia. And uh, just, just kind of because I took on so many hats in that project, like being sort of like a writer and then a producer and then a director and also like trying to edit it. I think the reason why it's the hardest thing I've ever done is because normally in projects I can specialize in a certain area of that project. But with that thing, I was wearing many hats that I wasn't used to. So it was hard on a lot of levels because, um, if I did a task, I would also have to learn how to, be a professional to do that task and learn really well, not to half-ass it, but to do it to the same level as somebody who would have years of experience doing that task. So I still think that's the hardest thing I've, I've ever done. It was harder than going into uh, Iraq and Syria, I think. You feel vulnerable when, or vulnerability is? Mm, of course. I feel vulnerable when... I slave over a project and put so much of myself into it and then put it out because I, uh, some, some other people that do similar projects can hide behind the subject matter, but in a lot of the videos I put out or writing that I put out, I'm very much integrated into it because it's the only way that I actually like know how to tell that story is through my perspective. So I add myself into, I insert myself into a lot of the projects and the feelings that I had. And that's a very vulnerable state to be in. And, uh, you know, sometimes that gets torn apart. Sometimes that gets trashed, the work, and in effect, trashes you. So when I put something new out, 
believe me, I'm refreshing the comments. <laughs> I'm looking at how many views because I feel vulnerable. I don't put it out and like go ride a roller coaster and put my phone in the little cubby hole so I can't have it. <laughs> I'm looking because I'm a vulnerable person. What people would be surprised to know about you? I think the most, the, the thing that really surprised people was actually when I put out that web series, Dudes with Cameras, uh, dudeswithcameras.com, everybody. Because they'd seen my writing and they'd seen my like tutorials on Photoshop and lighting. And, uh, you know, they're loose and personable, but they're still like, you know, very serious and very like about a technique and about a certain Photoshop technique. And I think that a lot of people didn't realize that on set, I basically can act like a goof or like a little bit lighthearted and, you know, not so serious to like make it a serious uh, project. And I think that's surprising for people because a lot of the images and visuals that I create are incredibly serious, but making them is, is a very human project and it's okay to have a sense of humor uh, in times like that. I think people will be really surprised to actually see the behind the scenes of the, of the Kurdistan project to see that like the, the fighters who fight the most notorious criminal gang ever created have a great sense of humor. Um, and, uh, I think that's surprising for people when they see like those newer behind the scenes videos where I've been not afraid to like edit out how I actually act, which is, a little bit more lighthearted than mm -hmm. what one might think. Why you do what you do? I do what I do because I have a unwavering passion and unwavering motivation. Even when things get uh, really complicated, I still end up doing the same thing and going back to the same trajectory as I was before. So I know that I'm sort of uh, meant to do this and not interested in doing anything else. Believe it or not, I've actually had like strange job offers in my career to change the trajectory or to like work for us doing that for a bit or do this for a bit. Job offers that maybe I'll make even more money than I am now, but I don't take any of them and I don't do them. And I'm not talking about projects. I'm talking about like full time career jobs. And um, I'm not interested. So back to your question, why do I do what I do? Uh, it's because every time I find myself fiddling in another area, I am always get back to where I started. Um, so I do what I do because I'm passionate about it and because I, tr I really care about the subject matters that I take on. And I think that I have something to add to the table. So we talked about that a little bit with the guerrilla fighters is like, They've been represented in so many different ways, but perhaps not the same way um, that I could throw into the mix. So I feel um, I feel like if I didn't, I'd be letting people down, actually. And finally, your words to live by. Like three words or? Like let her rip. <laughs> let her rip, no. <laughs> I would say um, passion and dedication and legitimacy are things that I value in others and things that I want to find in myself. It's wonderful. Thank you so much, Joey. Thank you for having me again on this uh, second podcast. <laughs> yeah, I know. And I'm glad it's not a video one. <laughs> 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 the the continuation of um, how can people I find you? I think I'm you? wearing the same shirt. You might be, but your pants are a lot less tight this yeah. time. Yes, because <laughs> I I've, yes, that was that was one of the comments. Is like whose pants are tighter? Summers or Joey's? <laughs> yeah, I think I think mine were mine were tighter. Um, how can people find you? Um, they can find my photography on my website joeyl.com. J o e y l dot com. They can follow me on Twitter, J-O-E-Y-L-D-O-T-C-O-M, so you're spelling out .com. You can find me on Instagram on the exact same handle, and you could find me on Facebook, facebook.com slash Joey L Photographer, or you can find me riding the subway <laughs> in New York, as, <laughs> where as most people, people do, and <laughs> they come up and talk to you and, um, and ask you <laughs> photography questions. That's, that's a nice thing, though. <laughs> 
Especially um, if I'm with my mom, because then my mom thinks you're famous. Thinks I'm famous. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and I just um, pretend like it always happens. And of course, uh, and of course, through dudes with cameras, which is new. And you can find that on your joeyl.com site as well. Or, or you can go to dudeswithcameras.com because I, yes. I, I bought that domain <laughs> in, in case it turned into a porn site. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that, I could see that the title could be co-opted for that use as well. But uh, thank you again. And um, I'm sure everybody's going to love hearing this story. And again, by the time this podcast comes out, you will be viewing uh, the Kurdish guerrilla fighters. So let's we, hope so. Yes, uh, we will. And um, thanks again. And looking forward, if you want to follow Idea Nosh, you can go on facebook.com slash Idea Nosh, or you can also follow me on Twitter. It's S-R-O-K-E-S. Thanks a lot. <laughs>